hate this idea that creativity should be rushed or it should be done within a certain time, which I remember I, was something that I really struggled with in school, having, you know, someone say, oh, you've got two hours now, do some art. And you'd be like, oh, I don't feel like it now. I want to do it later. <laughs> and it's like, well, that's not how school works. Yeah, I think you need time for creativity and it needs to come whenever it comes. And sometimes I think the most inspiring thing ever is boredom. When you're really bored, that's sometimes when I get some of my best ideas. Welcome to the third season of the York Creatives Podcast, your chance to hear from the wide range of artists, designers, storytellers, and everyone in between who make up York's creative community. My name is Ben Porter. I'm a photographer, musician, and the founder of York Creatives. In each episode, I chat with a local creative, uncovering the lessons they've learned through the pursuit of a creative practice. We discuss the things that keep them motivated when times get tough, skills they've acquired from unlikely places, how they go about finding creative opportunities, and the systems and frameworks they use to keep themselves focused in a world filled with distraction. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Amy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So I'm really excited to have you on and to dig into some of your story. So to start us off, can you just give me a bit of an introduction to who you are and what you do? Yeah, my name's Amy DeGorn. I'm a photographer based in York. I grew up here and then went to Edinburgh College of Art um, for my undergraduate, then travelled a lot, New Zealand, Japan, Canada, and then came back to the UK to do my master's in documentary photography, which I'm currently studying. Well, yeah. Cool. Lo- loads to unpack there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, let's start at the beginning. So why photography? What drew you to that art form in particular? Uh, my dad used to have a little dark room in our bathroom when I was very little. And I remember how exciting that was, kind of like the magic of photos just appearing on like plain paper um, and just the excitement of going into like this dark space. But um, I didn't really ever think about it as like a career choice until my A-levels when um, I had a teacher who, um, he wasn't actually a photography teacher, he was the art teacher, but he was just so passionate about um, art that he was really inspiring and we had a little dark room closet type thing in the in uh, All Saints um, which I ended up just spending all three periods in yeah so what kind of photos did your dad take um, I've, I've actually started going through some of his archive he both my parents were very big like political activists um, so I grew up going to like Menworth Hill and Filing Dales which are nuclear early warning systems but um so all of my dad's photographs are of uh protests from the, like the 1970s and 80s 90s 2000s <laughs> um of uh like anti-war protests for cnd and stuff but well, some of them are really cool um which i think maybe i'll try to do something with at some point yeah. but it's a big archive <laughs> oh, okay so that's that's fascinating i think it's um, something I've only really just thought about this moment, but often people who have um, early experiences from parents, mm. um, they tend to stick more if there's a particular theme that they're around. So for me, like both of my parents are fairly creative, but they would do various different things on all kinds of different themes. And so it just becomes like a general wash of creativity. Mm-hmm. But for you, there's much more of a story there, isn't there? I guess so. Yeah, I guess a lot of my like personal photographic work has always got an activist element which I hadn't really thought about before. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I definitely get it from them. Like, I don't know, they're both actually Green Party councillors in York or, okay. or my dad's deputy leader of the council, but they're both for Green Party. So um, I grew up around kind of environmental awareness, I guess. Um, even though it wasn't, I don't know, when I was in school, it was kind of like, you believe in climate change. <laughs> sure. But um, yeah, a lot of my work now definitely deals a lot with that kind of area okay well we will unpack that um but going back to so the art department darkroom yeah tell me a bit more about that um so it was a little cupboard um it was i think we had maybe five or six enlargers obviously all just black and white because color just gets a lot more complicated um and i just spend all my free periods in there i remember sometimes coming out and meet my friends at the end of the day they'd be like where have you been like "Mm, just in the photography darkroom (laughs) So was this 16, 17, that kind of age? Yeah. uh, I actually can't remember now whether you could, I think it was, I think it was only A-levels that you could do photography for. I don't think you could do it at GCSE. Mm -hmm. But I think I ended up doing photography as a part of my art GCSE. Um, And it just translated into me doing art and photography A-levels, which is quite a 
a lot of coursework so. and theatre and, <laughs> and English Lit. <laughs> so at that point, did did you realise it was possible to have a career in photography? Um, I think my like ideas around a career in photography have changed a lot, definitely, from, from then until now. Um, I think I kind of, I thought about it as a career then, definitely, but I wasn't sure if there was really any money in it, especially in more kind of artistic, like artist side of things rather than doing commercial work. Um, not to say that it's not artistic in itself, commercial work, but, um, and then definitely like going to university because it was an art school. You had a lot of, you know, oh, well, you graduate and mummy and daddy buy a place in a gallery or they have friends and that's how it works. And it's obviously not how it works if mummy and daddy don't have a gallery sure. or friends that have galleries. Um, so yeah, I think my ideas around photography as a career have changed a lot with a lot of unrealistic ideas and then realizations and then also realizing it is also possible. <laughs> you just yeah. don't need to be a snob about it. <laughs> so you kind of had this sense that there could perhaps be a career in art. Yeah. Were there other um, art forms that you were juggling at that point? You mentioned theatre. Yeah, I did theatre studies as well, which was, I was also kind of, um, I don't know, yeah, I almost chose to go to uh, drama schools, I actually ended up looking around a few as well, which is kind of sad because I don't do it at all anymore. Um, photography just kind of took over. But um, I did enjoy well, it a lot. You could say it's sad. You could also say it's you've you found the thing. The thing, Lots yeah. of people search for the thing their entire life and never find it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, no, in one way, I'm very lucky with it. Like, I definitely think photography is always going to be something that's there with me. Whatever happens, I'll always be taking pictures kind of thing. Um, as romantic as that sounds. So what won it for photography over theatre? Was there a particular moment or...? I think my whole... Um, interest in both of them or in art in general was really as a way to connect with people. So um, in theatre studies, we did like you had to write your own play and we chose to do verbatim theatre, which is where you it's really research based and you uh, anything that breaks the fourth wall and you speak to the audience about is um, directly from an interview or from someone like it's it's real life. It's verbatim. Um, so I really enjoyed the research for that and photography. I ended up doing, I think my A-level project thing I did with Arclight, which used to be a homeless shelter in York, um, um, photographing the rooms of people that were living there and trying to see what a space or, you know, what people chose to keep would say about that person. Um, and I definitely think it was just photography. I saw it as more, um, more immersed like more immersive or like you had more connection with people from all different backgrounds and from all different places and there was more accessibility to uh meeting those people and talking and finding out about how other people lived than there was with theatre although community theatre has a lot to say for it for um yeah those kind of things um, <laughs> so we've kind of established there's a want there now so you've decided that photography is something that you want to pursue Mm -hmm. um, so what were some of the challenges that stood in your way at that point? I mean, at that point, it was a case of getting into university um, or art school, uh, which is a hard thing in itself because it's extremely stressful for, you know, people when they're 18 or something to have to go from school to like applying and the stress of all these stupid forms they make you fill out and like, I can't remember what it's called, you know, that statement of interest. Okay. Um, and getting your portfolio together and everything. And quite a lot of the ones that are quite hard to get into, you have to end up going for an interview as well, um, which obviously can be quite nerve wracking for some people. But I've actually started helping people prepare for that now, which is quite a nice little side job. <laughs> sure. So you're in the stage where you've now, you've got to put yourself out there. You've got mm. to, uh, I was going to say try and have a voice, but... For some people, they will already have a voice. Mm. And for other people, it's very much um, an act of discovery. Um, what was it for you? Did you feel like you had a voice at that point? Or was it very much you were still trying to work it out? Like artistically, mm. do you mean? Um, I definitely think I had a, yeah, I had a voice or a style or a, um, I don't know, methodology or whatever you want to call it. Um, obviously, I think it's very different 
to how I work now, but that's all a part of, you know, developing your practice or how how your artistic creativity develops. Um, I'm trying to remember. I think I had a voice uh, theoretically, if that makes sense. I don't know if it was quite there uh, aesthetically. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, at, at that age, you're still, you're learning a lot about the kind of, you know, the method, method, not methodology, like the technical aspects of how to use whatever craft you've decided to use. Um, and I think there's something really nice about young people's work or like, you know, even young people, cause you know, some people come into creativity a lot later in life, but, um, there's something really nice about the, that kind of youngness of their creative practice in that it, it is, there is something quite pure or naive about it. It's very direct, yeah. um, which sometimes I think you end up missing, especially if you go through the educational system, which really makes you think about everything to the point of the fact that you're like, I just don't want to take pictures anymore. <laughs> I can't, can't do it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, it's almost, it's like punk music, isn't it? Yeah. Like people who can't quite play their instruments but have so much energy and have a lot to say. Yeah, yeah. Still create incredible art. Exactly. Yeah, it takes all kinds all walks of life. So obviously part of developing your voice and developing mm. your skills as a practitioner just comes through time and repetition. Yeah. Um, but were there any kind of key moments, um, key milestones along the way? So what was it like when you first started your degree? Do you remember being thrown into any particular challenges that really stretched you? Yeah, I mean, Edinburgh is quite, uh, well, the course has changed a lot now, but when I went, it was very self-led. Um, so you really had to be motivated to make the work um, otherwise there wasn't going to be anyone there really saying, oh, you haven't done it. You know, you had to go out and do it. Um, so I definitely learned a bit, bit better time management. No, the degree, definitely, it was very much a learning curve of learning how to self-motivate and kind of push yourself. But I think that's the really nice thing about art school is you're surrounded by so many people that really want to be there and really excited about, uh, you know, pushing their own practice into different fields and, you know, exploring. And that's what you should be doing at art school. It's kind of art school, art school, uh, uni is, is pushing yourself to, to do weird stuff and kind of things that are a bit out of side of your comfort zone. Um, so there was definitely that there, but I also did a semester abroad while I was in, um, university art school. Um, and I think that, was really a defining milestone for me where I was really, really fell in love with photography um, as a way of connecting to people that otherwise I wouldn't really have any reason to connect to. Sure. So let's dig into that then. Tell me about that. Um, so I did my semester abroad in Baltimore in Maryland, which is a really cool city, really beautiful, um, really friendly people, um, but does have quite a reputation. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen The Wire but that's like a TV show from the nineties when mm -hmm. Baltimore was like murder capital. Um, but I had an amazing teacher there, uh, Colette Vesey. Um, and she was, she, cause in America you do it, you, like the university is a bit different and you choose, uh, things to major in and minor in and like you choose your own modules in your own course. And obviously they pay through the roof for it. So it makes sense. But um, I was doing a module in photojournalism, which I do have a lot of ethical issues with. Um, but I also had a French friend who had seen The Wire and she was super excited about being in Baltimore and being in this place that she'd seen on TV back in France. And um, so she kind of railed me in to hire some like push bikes with her and go down into the hood or, or like the neighborhoods where the wire was filmed, which are still pretty dangerous. And you do get like heckled a lot because you are the only white person there. So it makes sense you do. Um, but we were cycling around there and uh, some guys just kind of yelled at her like, hey girl, I want to ride your bike kind of thing. And she was like, no, I think you might steal it. <laughs> and they found that hilarious. Okay. Um, and fortunately, um, and started talking to us and uh, just, you know, saying like, oh, you're not from around here. <laughs> what, the, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> so how old were you at this point? Uh, 21, because I was just legal to drink there. Okay. I remember, yeah. Quite brave. 
Yeah, yeah. Or, or stupid. <laughs> That's a very thin line. <laughs> um, but we made a really nice connection with them and I'm still in contact with them now and I really need to go back because they were like, they were the first photographs that I took um, that I was, I think that I was really proud of. Um, I really thought, and it was when I, it was the first kind of project where I started thinking about them more than just photographs. Um, so the, like the project itself, I used... It was like one of the guys that I was chatting to there and we like all got each other on Instagram um, so I could send them the photographs afterwards. Uh, but he had a really beautiful like post just like with writing that was talking about how they're not a hood, they're a family and like families might fuss and fight, but that's what families do. Um, and I really wanted all of, I put that with the images because I really wanted it to kind of dispel some of the stigma and the stereotypes that surrounded that neighborhood because they were so friendly and they were so nice. Um I actually went back, uh, so that was in 2014, and then I went back in 2016 and 2018 and photographed the same family again. Wow. Um, and I, then COVID happened in 2020, so <laughs> and everything happened. But I really need to go back um, as soon as I've finished my degree and have some time to do that. Um, sure. Yeah. So was the uh, Baltimore area, was it one of, um, like... Was it one of multiple choices you were offered or did you pick that specifically? I or? picked that one specifically. There was Baltimore, New York or Pennsylvania, I think, in America. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a friend who was the year above me in uh, in Edinburgh and she had been to Baltimore. So and she loved it, like absolutely loved it and was just like, you need to go. You have to go. And I remember like when I put my application in, well, there was the application deadline and I like was writing it last minute as you do. I remember I had to run into school to like give it in and I had maybe like two minutes to spare, but I was so glad that I got there. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, so was that one of the projects which helped you uh, get onto your current masters? Um, I'm not sure if it is. I think my approach to it was, I remember when I had my interview for my current master's, um, I was actually in Morocco at the time and the, the course, Lisa, uh, course Lisa, course leader, Lisa. Uh, course Lisa is a pretty yeah, cool course, name. Course Lisa. <laughs> uh, Skyped me. I had like a Skype interview for it because I was um, on holiday. Um, and she, she did say, oh yeah, your photos are okay, but you know, I'm more excited about the ideas or the way you approach it and what you can create if you come on this course, which was very nice because I've been preparing for hours of like answering questions, like any questions she might have, but okay. she just started off being like, you should do this course. Right. <laughs> Here's well, your place. Okay. <laughs> I was like, well, thank you. Very telling of someone's character. When they really nice. that. <laughs> she's yeah, she's terrifying, but brilliant. <laughs> okay. Why is she brilliant? What has she been teaching you? Um, she's, she's, very, very smart, terrifyingly smart, um, can reel off photographic theory like it's a shopping list or, you know, anything. Um, she's extremely direct and sometimes I think she sometimes scares people a little bit, but it's kind of what you need on a master's course I think you need to be challenged and she wants you to argue back with her which works quite well for me because I'm quite argumentative <laughs> um, but it's I think it's just her teaching you to fight your corner um, because the industry isn't very nice and sure. you do need to have a little bit of tough skin to continue getting rejection letters and keep going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's something about those types of teachers who are very tough, but get the best out mm. of people. It's like, have you seen the film Whiplash? No, I still haven't. Uh, I okay, need definitely to. watch that. Yeah, yeah. But, um, I'm sure anybody listening who has seen yeah. it will recognise the parallel straight away. Yeah. Um, do you know the concept about the drummer who... I've seen the trailer. Yeah. I'm really bad at just watching endless trailers and <laughs> not <right>. committing. <laughs> so basically, yeah, drummer wants to be an incredible drummer. And yeah. He's got like the worst, harshest teacher ever, um, but manages to get the best out of him. Mm. So no. very, very well worth a watch. Yeah, yeah. And I definitely think Lisa's like that. Um, so what is Lisa's work like? Uh, so she's, her uh, most recent book was The Canary and the Hammer, uh, which is a, I hope she never listens to this because I'm going to describe it really badly. It's, um, it's a photographic investigation of uh, gold, um, everything like from all the ways it's been used uh, for like, uh, you know, in China, how it's 
like the dangerous ways that's extra- extracted from phones or tablets and everything like that to how it's used within the military, how it's used within NASA, um, gold, uh, gold mines in Peru, actually, in South America. Um, one thing I do really like about it, though, is because like she does have an ethical side to it as well. So the pictures, she's got pictures of the women who um, kind of go around on the tops of the mines in South America because they're not allowed down the mines. Um, so they have to just pick out tiny scraps of whatever's left on top. Um, but there's an ethical company that pays them properly for that gold um, and to support it. She, the, in the book, what the pictures of the women are actually very, very finely gold plated on the back with the gold from that place. So wow. the, some of the money goes back into it kind of thing, yeah. which I like. <laughs> so so how do you feel when you're looking at her work and I guess her career does that feel motivational to you or does it feel a bit daunting like talk me through that definitely daunting but I think there's all different kinds of like of course there's all different kinds of people creatives and the way that they choose to work and the way that and obviously that connects with the way that they choose to live their life um another inspiration for me is definitely Hannah Starkey who's another a female photographer. I don't know if you know the Hepworth Gallery. It's in Wakefield. Um, but I was very lucky. I finally got a good thing um, and got, um, she's doing a commission there at the moment and she wanted to work with, uh, I think there's eight of us, eight female photographers from Yorkshire. So I'm doing that at the moment and helping her with that, which is really good fun. But she, I, I was talking to her about Lisa's work ethic and just, how impressive it is but also how kind of daunting it is to like she does so much she's like doing you know a shoot in this country and the next week she's teaching us and she's teaching us from the all these other countries and doing exhibitions all over the world book launches all of the time um and Hannah was kind of like yeah it's impressive she was like I can't believe how people do live like that I personally can't um she has she's like I've got two daughters they're important to me in my time. And, you know, I'd say they're equally successful, you know, female artists, Um, but they just choose to live differently and, you know, that's okay. (laughs) Some people work slow, some people work fast. Um, I have a dog and she takes up a lot of my time. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so you were saying that Lisa teaches you how to fight your corner and defend your ideas. Mm. Um, what are some of her techniques for, for doing that? She's <laughs> like a chihuahua, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, research, yeah, definitely. No, like she always says, know your shit. Or if I shouldn't swear on this, know your stuff. You know, if you're going to be talking about something, you need to know it. Like you need to know it inside out. Um, you need to know what your work is about. You can't... I mean, her work is very kind of analytical and um, research based. So, of course, it has to she has to know that research inside out. So if she is doing a talk, you you know, you're not there with notes or anything. You know it like it's already in your head and um, know the reasons why you've done everything because someone will ask you. And you don't want to look like an idiot. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> for, just to relate this um, to something that's going on in my head, when I hear mm. that, I think, sure, yeah, that definitely makes sense. If you want to spend time working on a project, you need mm. to know quite a lot about it. But then I think, oh, no, I'm working on so many projects. I don't have enough time to, to do all this. Yeah. And I think, well, actually, that, this probably comes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is like find your thing and commit mm. to it. Um, I think a lot of us creatives, we have shiny object syndrome and we chase too many things at once. Do you feel that? Do you feel like when you're asked to research a project, you think, oh, but if I do this, then it means I can't do that one. And how do I choose? No, I just try to do them all and kind of <laughs> collapse in <laughs> collapse in agony. Um, no, I definitely know what you mean. I am i don't know if I've got ADHD or something, but I'm terrible when I'm doing research. I'll do a bit on something and then turn around to do a bit on another go do the washing up come do a little bit of another do half the washing up go back finish the washing up do a bit you know call this person or write down that I need to call this person go back on the research then call the person I'm just yeah Yeah. it's kind of organized chaos I guess um I don't think you have to choose sorry no I don't think you have to choose um and knowing your stuff doesn't have to be like you know it doesn't have to take up all of your time 
but I guess that's a part of the kind of the way that she works as well. Like even like we obviously have a, like a Facebook group for our master's class and, um, she's always posting opportunities and like talks that we should listen to and this and that. And, Oh, I read this wonderful book. And I'm like, when, when did you read the book? I don't know when you had time. <laughs> like, but I think she's just one of those people that has to be doing something. Um, she's, I've heard her speak about it before. And she says, whenever she's, you know, almost finished something, she's like, well, I'll be bored. I need to start something quickly. It's just different ways that different people work. Whereas I am definitely quite slow. Um, I like, you know, if I'm researching something, I want to read a book slowly and I can't, yeah, I just can't hurry. Sure. Well, speed is obviously one thing, um, but then there's a quite a lot of parallels between the way you were describing here and the way you described yourself in that there is mm -hmm. this uh, delicate balance between order and chaos. <laughs> and I found this myself, if I yeah. go too far one way, um, it's really impossible to create anything if there's too much chaos or too much order. Yeah. You don't get any new ideas at that point. No, it's true. Um, I hate this idea that creativity should be rushed or it should be uh, done within a certain time, which I remember I, was something that I really struggled with in school, like in A-levels and everything, was having, you know, someone say, oh, you've got two hours now, do some art. And you'd be like, oh, I don't feel like it now. I want to do it later. <laughs> it's like, well, that's not how school works. <laughs> well, it's, that's not how crea like creativity works. Um, yeah, I think you need time for creativity and it needs to come whenever it comes. And sometimes I think the most inspiring thing ever is boredom. When you're really bored, that's sometimes when I get some of my best ideas, yeah. I think. Yeah. So do you have a practice for um, capturing these ideas when you come up with them and saving them for later? Or do you very much have to do them in the moment or they disappear? No, I'm very much a like let them mull kind of thing. Um, I have endless notes on my phone or like I'll be taking a picture of something and I think you can actually put it in your notes now. Um, endless different sketchbooks with like weird drawings of what a photograph will look like. <laughs> I'm not very good at drawing. Used to be. But um, yeah, I have to write them down. I actually like, I still use a sketchbook um, for projects, which I, Lisa says, oh, I don't want to see sketchbooks, but I have to do it for myself. Um, just otherwise I forget things I've researched or photographs I've taken. And it makes such a difference to like to print things out and to look at them. And then you start seeing the similarities, like visual strategies or like possible spaces where there should be a different photograph and you can start thinking about what that should be, if that makes sense. It's very sure. abstract. No, it does. <laughs> yeah, we all have our own processes, don't we? <laughs> so with the masters, is this, um, I guess there was a period between going to art school the first time and doing the masters. Um, what was the gap there? Five years. Yeah, quite a while. Uh, and I do. Yeah. So I got an internship in Japan when I finished my degree, uh, which was in photography and video, which was fun because I've never done video before. Um, um, and that was amazing. Like very lucky. They paid for everything and gave me some money as well, wow. um, which is nice. Um, and it was for a NGO based in uh, Tokyo, but they paid for us to travel to like Kyoto, which like the old one the old city and Kyushu at the bot like the bottom island um and all over um just doing work for them they were a charity that uh tried to get children who had lost one or more parents into higher education which was quite cool um and then went to visit a friend in South Korea stayed there for a little bit and then lived in Canada for a year working in a horrible photography studio uh, which did like family portraits for really posh people um, up at this place called Lake Louise, uh, which is near Banff. It's up in the Rockies, mm -hmm. beautiful mountains. Lint snowboard, got very bruised. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think the worst part was at Christmas when I had to do Santa photos and it's just these screaming children and like Canadian, not quite American, but Canadian mums being like, I'll just take another one. He'll, he'll stop crying soon. Wait the bear, <laughs> wait the bear. And you're like, Oh God, what am I doing here? <laughs> but, well, you picked up the accent. Didn't yeah. Else? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to anyone Canadian listening. <laughs> um, and then, and then my grandpa was ill. So I came back to the UK for six months, kind of didn't know what I was doing. 
Um, it's always, I think everyone, if they come back from traveling and, you know, you come back and you end up at your parents' house and you're like, oh God, what am I doing? <laughs> um, so was the masters potentially in your head at that point? Were you thinking about it and putting it I was it off thinking or? about it. Um, I definitely knew that I wanted to do one. I didn't think that I was there yet creatively, if that made sense. Um, I know a lot of people go directly from their undergraduate to their masters, which is fine if it suits them. But I think in a lot of cases, and obviously it depends what you want that master's for. So if you're wanting it because you want to do teaching, of course it makes sense to just do it straight away um, because there's a goal after that. But um, for me, I wasn't really, I didn't think I was creatively ready and it made more sense to have time to kind of develop your practice, but also develop yourself as a person and how you see the world a bit Mm. before going into another creative like um sure so let's program. dive in let's dive into that a bit more because i think quite a lot of people are in that place where they think i've got this thing which i really enjoy doing and i would love to make something out of it but i'm not sure if i'm quite ready yet to take the next step um what was it that got you from that stage to actually making the decision to go well <laughs> after i came back to the uk i went and moved to new zealand for two years um and when i was there um i started working more creatively again. I mean, I was doing food photography for Uber Eats, which wasn't really that stimulating because it's extremely formulaic, Um, but paid better over there, which was good. Um, But I also ended up doing, I don't know if you've heard of Woofing. It's like, it's worldwide organization of organic farming, Mm -hmm. Um, but it's like a work away volunteer thing you can do. And I ended up doing it with this uh, amazing New Zealand artist called uh, Fiona Clark, who if you have, if you like, I don't know, photography, you should look at her. She kind of documented the queer scene, queer scene in New Zealand in like the 1980s and uh, 70s maybe. Um, but yeah, I ended up staying with her at her mad house, uh, which is just an old converted dairy factory um, in Tikarangi, which is a small village in Taranaki, sorry, in New Zealand. Um, and... I kind of just saw the life she had and was like, I'd really, I do still want to be like that artist because she had, um, she was mad. She was like seven. She is, sorry. She is like 70 something. Um, There's actually a documentary film out on her now that's nearly out, I think, which I really want to see. But she'd be up, you know, like 40 foot ladders and then down the next day in her dark room printing and then the next day on the roof, like mending it. And um, she just, seemed so creative and free and um i was like i want that yeah although she was a hoarder definitely she got, mm. she got i don't know i shouldn't say that on here <laughs> <laughs> so if it was seeing somebody else doing it and thinking yeah. i want that um what was it before because it sounded to me like you had a pretty good idea that you wanted to do photography you're mm. actually making a living from photography which not everybody can do lots of people have to work other jobs to support i was working at the jobs as well yeah okay. yeah no i don't want to i don't want to push that lie that literally every single photographer has managed to make it easily it's definitely something i still struggle with um for sure like uh i still work weekends friday and saturday now i've got it down to at a bar um I'm just terrible at the business side and I'm terrible at asking people for money. And even when people ask me to do photos and just ask me how much they want, uh, I want them to give me, I'm still like, ah, I don't know, just half of what I should really ask, which is really bad. It's a terrible thing. And you really do need to know your worth and stick to your guns and say, this is my price. If you want it, then that's what it is. Hmm. But it's something I still definitely struggle with. Have any of the either art school or the masters touched on this topic at all? The masters more so. The art school was phew, terrible, probably as useful as a chocolate teapot. But um, yeah, art school didn't teach me anything about business or um, you know pitching to people or you know uh, approaching galleries, applying to things, how to apply to public funding, how to do any of that stuff. Any admin, it was nothing. Um, <clears throat> sorry ECA <laughs> uh, whereas I chose my master's based on that being a part of the requirement that I wanted to learn um, because Edinburgh College of Art has quite a reputation and is quite prestigious and all of this I don't think they I don't know if it's they didn't bother or that they just thought that 
the students that are going to go there are already going to be wealthy and aren't going to need that kind of uh, funding, <laughs> um, money. Uh, but USW definitely taught, teaches a lot more about kind of the practical sides of applying to uh, grants funding or um, making a dossier or pitching to brands or, you know. And do you feel like that feeling of not being sure if you quite had the business side of the skills mm -hmm. fed into the feeling of not being sure if you're ready to go to the next stage or not? Because I'm sure um, both myself and for people listening, we all know other creatives who we think your work's not that good, but you've got loads of work. <laughs> you're getting paid all the time. And, and why is it? And often yeah. when you dig into it is because they've spent the time reading business books and they've learned how to pitch themselves and they've, they've got a business there. Um, but it's, it feels antithetical to what so many creatives want to do with their lives um, to spend the time learning that, isn't it? Like we get into these creative things because we get so excited by not having a real job, by going and <laughs> doing creative things and following these stories. And then suddenly we realize like, ah, I've got to run my own business now. Yeah. So, no, I just agree with all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so the, question, the question in that was, do you think not having the business skills fed into this kind of unsure and the self-doubt period? Um. I don't know if it fed into unsure self-doubt period. I think it more fed into, right, I really need to learn how to do that kind of motivation, I guess, in a way. Um, it was definitely a part of what motivated me to go back to the, do my master's. Um, but it's always such a struggle. I don't know why, like, I think it's, and a lot of people struggle with this in all different art forms kind of uh balancing commercial work and their own personal work that they just want to do to do like because they want to do it um and it's still something I struggle with like do you have to be just an artist who gets all of their money from you know either private donors which apparently is a thing which I didn't know before very kind of 19th century mm. <laughs> but um from private donors <laughs> and uh, um like funding bodies and doing artist retreats or artist residencies and like doing it that way or or do you have to go like you don't have to just go the commercial route or do you kind of balance it um it's still something i think i'm a little unsure about but something that i've more recently realized that yeah, you balance it and you do a bit of each whenever you can. And it is a balancing act to make sure that you don't become the poor starving artist and you don't become the commercial photographer who loses that love for what you're doing. Um, yeah, you definitely have to balance it a lot. So where are you in the Masters? Are you towards the end? Yes, crunch time. I have a big hand in uh, in 10 days. Well, oh, okay. And I go to Peru the same day, which is also for my master's project, but for the next hand in, which is September, which okay. is like the final, final one. So how long is the master's in total? It's like over two years. Oh. Yeah. Is that um, full time or is that split? That's part time. Okay. But um, so it used to be optional to do it full time, but uh, the course now is only part time. And I think Lisa's made it full time, part time. Like it feels like <laughs> it's full time, but it's called part time because <laughs> okay. you're expected to do at least, I think, 20 hours a week work on it, which is part time, I guess. But that's like outside of the university hours when there's two days a week in the university. Well, online in it. And then everyone's juggling other jobs and yes. other photography projects. Yes, or that. families and other commitments. Yeah, it's intense, but good. So what is the hope once you finish? Previously... <laughs> It was work like larger commercial work. I think, I don't know. I think I've, I keep on getting disillusioned with it really because originally I was quite interested in doing kind of editorial things for like, you know, like New York Times or The Observer or kind of those kinds of magazines. Financial Times is really nice. Um, and Emma Bocat, who's the ed editor, has a really good taste in photography. Um but then because there's quite a few people in my class that are already starting to do that and you learn how little it pays, it can be quite disheartening just because you will get more doing work for like a local business mm -hmm. um, 
which is quite disgusting, really. It says a lot about the state of the photography industry that, you know, The Guardian only pays 250 a day. Mm. Uh, I think New York Times and Washington Post pay up to like 500. But that's still, you know, people do a wedding and get one to two grand in a day. Yeah. Um, but you have so many photographers fighting and, you know, dreaming about working for these kind of businesses. So it's just... I don't really have a solution for it, but... <laughs> is this what you were referring to earlier when you mentioned photojournalism ethics, or was that another thing? No, my, I have a lot of issues with photojournalism and the role it plays within NGOs and them not really helping the people that they say they're helping um, and ending up just continuing um, issues that they're photographing. So how could they improve that? Um there's a really, if you want to go for photography theory, there's a really good essay. Um, if you want to kind of start on ethics in photography called Towards the Abolition of Photography's Imperial Rights. It's a bit of a mouthful, uh, but it's by a photography critic writer um, called Ariella Azule. And she has loads and loads of writing on photography and ethics and the issues surrounding photojournalism. Um, and how it can end up just being extremely exploitative of the people it's, you know, trying to help. Yeah, we've all seen that kind of, it's become a meme now, isn't it? Starving children. Oh, get my camera out. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, uh, there's another guy called Renzo Martins. It's called Enjoy Your Poverty. And it's quite a hard hitting documentary on documentary photography. <laughs> So he's kind of looking at the way that uh, photographers go and photograph poverty um, and how, you know, he uses visual imagery to kind of place, you know, looking at photographers, looking at vultures. And there's that horrible similarity in the way that they stalk their prey. I mean, even the language around photography is kind of terrible, mm. extremely kind of predatory. Um, obviously, photography kind of emerged around the same time that the height of imperialism and you know shooting capturing taking it's not really nice language um which i hope and try to kind of um work against in my own work but it is very hard to do <laughs> especially if you start reading about it you just end up going in circles so i have that quite often because I'm a photographer too, and often I'll say I was shooting this person, and people will be like, oh, "Hang on, yeah, what, yeah." <laughs> what do we say? Is, uh, what, what photographing, say yeah, okay. photographing this person. Can I make a picture of you? Um, I don't know. There's a lot of writings as well on like decolonializing photography. Um, the book that that's in is Capitalism and the Camera, and that's a really good book and fairly accessible. It's not too too heavy on the theory. Well, it's fascinating for me. It's a whole side to photography that I've never even considered, if I'm mm. honest. I mean, for me, I very much got into it from a documentary point of view. I was playing in a band and we were going all these different places and I thought I want to capture some of this because mm. in 20 years' time, I'll have forgotten most of it. And so very much picked up a camera, started documenting things, ended up documenting other people's businesses. And I was like, oh, there's money to be made here. Got into the commercial side of it. Yeah, the ethics of it isn't really something that I started to consider until a couple of years into the business. And I remember actually on a previous podcast that I've done, I was interviewing another filmmaker and we both were working at advertising at the time. And I remember asking him saying, do you ever really think about the ethics of what we do? We take ideas and put them in people's heads to try and make them buy products. Mm -hmm. um, and he was sort of like, well, not really. We don't write the stories. We just make them for the people. And I was like, well, yeah, but you're still complicit. Yeah. And this is not to put him down or the advertising industry down. I was in it for several years. Um, but it was something that ended up weighing on me quite heavily and eventually I decided to leave the advertising world. But there's just so many parts to it, isn't there? Yeah, there's many faceted. Um, so yeah, how do you make that money bit? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it is, yeah, it is multifaceted and there's ethical pitfalls everywhere. And of course, like, you know, you can go too far and end up just, you know, taking apart the ethics of everything and then you just end up doing nothing but um i definitely think it's important for everyone to consider them because otherwise nothing will change um and the w things won't get better yeah i never think i to be honest i've never thought about ethics in terms of advertising either before or people that are complicit in that i guess as like working commercially i always 
I mean, partially just through being terrible at advertising myself, but mostly I'll be working for either local brands or friends. So I'll usually know them quite personally and know that they're ethical as such. Um, but I hadn't ever actually considered about the fact that working for bigger brands means that you're complicit in whatever they do in a way. But then it runs so tricky. deep. I know. You know. Every product we use, I know, you can I know. never be 100% sure so, of well, that yeah. <laughs> Can't buy Batoli anymore. It's got palm oil. Can't. <laughs> yeah. And the... Um, Can't buy Sabra hummus anymore. It's... Yeah, the minerals and metals that are in all our mobile phones. Like, they're yeah. probably not super great if you follow them back to the source. Yeah, yeah, I know. Like, uh, batteries and lithium mining's terrible. Mm. But then what can you do? Yeah. You know, when you've got, know. Your, you've got your own challenge of trying to find the courage to put yourself out there and to become an artist, and then you've got all these other things weighing down on you, you can end up, you can end up just not wanting to get out of bed. You just end up lying there staring at the ceiling going, well, I can't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's tricky. I always thought about that, especially with photography as well, like uh, whether, I didn't know if digital photography is more ethical because, you know, the chemicals you use within film and majoritively I use film or like analog photography for all my personal work and some commercial work actually because it's kind of making a bit of a comeback um but then obviously yeah digital cameras you have the batteries and the precious minerals that are within them and i actually don't know if that's more or less ethical than film and chemicals although there is there's a i think they're in leeds the sustainable dark room um there's quite a few sustainable dark rooms actually popping up that are experimenting, experimenting more and more with um, using plant-based developers and stuff to develop film to make it a little less icky. Sure. Yeah. So on the days when all these revolving challenges and things uh, do line up and you feel like this is definitely what I want to be doing with my life, this is what's exciting me at the moment, this is what I'm moving towards. Tell me, what does that feel like to feel like you're actually on the path to be able to um, create stuff that has a positive impact on the world? so exciting <laughs> yeah it feels really good um sorry i should sound more positive i'm just like stressed about going to peru and everything but i'm gonna be extremely excited when i do get there um i think it's just like it's exciting when you do get those yeses um and you really have to like it sucks but you really have to keep going and it is i feel like it's not it is like a determination race almost um, like there's one thing that's always stuck with me is my uh, professor one of my professors in America he came in with this massive box um, just like dumped it on the desk it was like full of papers and he was like well that's all of the rejection letters I got within the first two years of leaving university and he was like collect rejection letters it sounds silly but collect rejection letters because then you will get those yeses as well because people will apply to one or two things and they'll get rejected and it like especially the first few times it happens it's painful it's really painful um but it's just to keep going and to keep trying because then you will you will get people saying yes um and the people that do become successful i swear it's just because they well obviously some people are just lucky or some people are just rich but um, <laughs> most of them are extremely determined and uh keep going because they love it and they want to do it. Mm. It's that yeah. whole thing about luck surface area, isn't it? Have you heard that? No. So yeah, the thing about luck surface area, the idea is if luck is being in the right place at the right time, if you put yourself in more places then there's more chance that you'll be there at the right time. So you increase your overall surface area of luck. I like it. And it's like positive thinking. I swear positive thinking works. Definitely. Big fan. Because you're always thinking, if you're like always putting something out there, and you're always looking for it, you're far more likely to see it than if you're looking at the floor being sad that you haven't got it. Yeah. And just on a psychological level, like we like spending time around people who are happy and more like to give yeah. them opportunities than someone yeah. who's like, oh, nothing ever goes right in my life. It's yeah. like, I'm probably not going to employ you, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Although that is sad, isn't it? <laughs> so one thing you've talked about quite a lot is the opportunity to go traveling and to visit other cultures and to document things like that. Um, if there's anyone who's listening who is really into photography, but perhaps doesn't have the resources to be able to go and do that, um, are there any other, is there any advice you would give them? Any projects you think that they could try? Anything that you would recommend that can be done on a smaller scale with less resource? Yeah, I mean, um, when you say resource, do you mean money or or time? And I guess everything, isn't it? Like Yeah, so it's money, resource and contacts is a big yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, 
I think also any photography project can start anywhere. Some of the best photography projects are in someone's back garden or back room or something. You know, you don't you don't have to go to far flung places to see the extraordinary. Um, there's there's a whole host of photographers who you know I think very much involved within like the first color photographers in the eight seventies sixties. I'm going to get that wrong. Um, but you know, if you want to look at William Eggleston, uh, he was extremely famous for photographing the everyday, um, or Joe Sternfeld, Alex Soth, who's another um, another one that just photographs really beautifully what's there, um, if that makes sense. Um, I think the photographer that made me really fall in love with photography was Tarkovsky, Andrei Tarkovsky, who's uh, also a famous filmmaker. Um, and there's a book of his Polaroids called Instant Light that's really beautiful and just the way that it talks about photography as well is extremely mesmerizing and there's poems and stuff in it um, and that's what made me kind of start thinking just about looking so like for people wanting to do start doing personal projects and stuff I don't think you know you don't need to travel anywhere you can you can just kind of start looking at light I think because obviously light's such a big part of photography and just kind of understanding how light works and how light works within the camera and how that translates and you'll go on a whole magical journey. <laughs> Be lovely. <laughs> cool. So last question. Uh, what will success look like for you? Oh, success. Nice house in the country <laughs> with my own dark room. Um, several books published. Um, exhibiting regularly internationally um choosing commercial work for ethical brands um that's quite a lot already yeah it's quite a lot uh, do you feel like it's within your grasp do you feel like you're getting there like you're on that path i definitely think i'm on the path maybe like near the garden gate kind of walking up but um quite a way to go definitely but i've been working on a project now for almost two and a half, three years, which is actually probably the longest I've worked on a singular project before. Um, so hopefully, I definitely need to do a lot more work on it, but hopefully I will, when I graduate, I'm going to be trying to find publishers and stuff to try and get that published into a book. Um, but a lot of them don't actually pay for it anymore. Hmm. The dream one would be Mac. Mac Books is a photo book publisher who publish beautiful photography books um and they actually contribute and help to the uh, payment of it but a lot of the others um you just have to come up with the money yourself which a lot of photographers do just through kickstarter and other things like that but um yeah it'd be good to publish a book so if people want to see some of this work you've been talking about where do they go um i do have a website which needs to be updated does anybody have a website that doesn't need to be updated? I know, it's, it's immediately. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> um, which is amydagorn.format.com. Um, and there's all my old pictures from Baltimore and stuff in there. Um, uh, but I post more regularly on my Instagram, probably. Cool. Um, which is easier to find. We can put all the links in the description so people yeah. can just click through. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Thank it's you. Great. It's actually quite fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>